Welcome back. We're going to talk today about anxiety and mood disorders. Going to get into some specifics regarding some mental health disorders today. So anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders are overwhelming apprehension and fear accompanied by an autonomic nervous system arousal. This is an important distinction here. This isn't just excessive worry or, uh, you know, kind of concern about the future or anything like that. We have to take it a step further. It has to involve the autonomic nervous system receiving some uh, some panic warnings. There's going to be some physical sensations associated with this worry that's telling the person something is very wrong. There's imminent danger about to come. And there's, uh, again, a, a pretty wide variety of, uh, of symptoms and, and presentations that we can see with regard to anxiety disorders. And we'll go into each of these in, in some depth in the coming slides. We'll take a look at generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, some phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, and lastly, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Generalized anxiety disorder is characterized by persistent, uncontrollable, and free-floating anxiety. People who have this disorder feel that something bad is about to happen and, and that they can't quite pinpoint what it might be. They may have some general kind of areas of concern like finances or health or, uh, or having a, you know, a job or losing their job, for example, uh, but they don't necessarily have a clear grasp on what they could do to prevent that bad thing from happening. It's just this feeling as if their, their life is unraveling or that something, something bad is, is about to happen. Uh, you know, when we have, when people who aren't, perhaps aren't struggling with this disorder have a, an issue coming up that's causing some concern, many of us can approach it with some thoughts or some steps of what we could do or we could seek advice from others and we can overcome it or at least kind of grapple with the fact that it may be stressful for the moment and then kind of let it go. Somebody who has generalized anxiety disorder will kind of move from moment to moment in that state of anxiety that even if that moment comes and goes, there's something right afterwards that's that's ready to uh, uh, to kind of present that anxiety for them again. They're going to feel uh, feel concerned, feel worried, uh, have that kind of tightness in their chest and that, that uh, dull headache or kind of, uh, uh, kind of mental anguish with regard to the future and what could be or what could not be coming. And that alone is going to uh, cause a significant amount of concern for somebody. And again, it's kind of free-floating. It's, it's here and there and everywhere, and it's, it's kind of difficult to pinpoint. Generally, with, with uh, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, while it's very essentially all-encompassing and, and really uh, can can take over a person's life, it's generally considered to be a little bit lighter on the anxiety disorder kind of scale uh, compared to some of these other ones that ha are a bit more severe but uh, kind of present themselves in specific windows of time or specific moments, uh, specific settings, scenarios, things like that, as as you'll see. So starting off, generalized anxiety disorder, as the name implies, it's kind of anxiety about everything. Uh, and it's significant enough to cause problems, but it's uh, it, the, the person just kind of feels this anxiety all the time. Panic disorder can be described as sudden and inexplicable panic attacks. Now, a panic attack is a rapid onset of, of primarily physiological symptoms uh, that reach a peak in about 10 minutes' time and then it'll begin to subside gradually afterwards. Uh, it can happen the, suddenly within a matter of 30 seconds or a minute. It could take a couple of minutes to get there. But roughly, uh, give or take a few minutes, after about 10 minutes, uh, we're going to start to see things kind of subside. Now with uh, a panic attack, there could be uh, uh, sweating, um, uh, your heart could be racing, feel tight in the chest, uh, a strong headache. You have uh, the the psychological experience of impending doom, in, intense worry. It's it's really uh, a panic attack can be very debilitating, very crippling to a person in the moment because they can't focus on anything else but this impending doom. If you imagine kind of a worst case scenario, and someone could tell you with a like clear premonition, this is about to happen without a shadow of a doubt that's going to send anybody in this kind of crippling, oh my goodness, anxiety attack. Um, that is what we would call a panic attack. It's, it's uh, this 
he experiences is quite unnerving, very shaking. And a panic disorder is when panic attacks happen with some frequency. Uh, they could occur in some people as often as uh, several times a day. Uh, in, in others could happen several times a week or several times a month. Um, so it's kind of these recurring experiences of these panic attacks of just sudden onset of intense worrying and physical pain and and uh, and horrible sensations and uh, and just thinking that something terrible is about to happen but kind of goes away after just uh, 15 minutes or so phobias can be uh, uh, are kind of like intense irrational fears and are often most popularly recognized as being related to a specific object or situation. So having a, a phobia of rats, for example, or uh, having a phobia of clowns, being, being afraid of something that, that if you could kind of take a step back, take a step out of your head or ask a friend to kind of describe the, the fear to you in a sense of what is it like to be afraid of this uh, you may be able to think like okay that sounds a little bit silly like if you know if you have a friend perhaps who uh, works with uh, in, in a pet store and they have to handle um, crickets and snakes and, and uh, mice and, and whatnot on a regular basis they don't seem scared uh, but maybe you have a fear of that ask them to see if they can describe a fear like that to you and you'll find it's a little bit difficult uh, for the other person to really see what it's like to be to have that kind of a fear about the exact same object. Um, and this is this is what uh, is essentially the hallmark of a specific phobia, that it's kind of an irrational, strange kind of fear and avoidance of an object uh, that may or may not pose a real physical threat to you, um, and uh, uh, or at least doesn't currently pose a physical threat to you but may at one point have uh, uh, caused some significant stress and now that remains as a phobia like perhaps you woke up once and had a spider on your face and that really scared you you didn't know what it was going to do to you and therefore it lingers over time that you're always afraid spiders are going to be crawling on your face and whatnot um, so phobias again fall under the anxiety disorder category because of that intense sensation of feeling like something bad is going to happen worrying about the future, worrying about the unknown and what's about to happen of, of could I be harmed, could I be in danger, and, uh, and trying to avoid these objects so that you are not put in that line of danger. Obsessive compulsive disorders, uh, th this is the intrusive, repetitive, fearful thoughts, the obsessive part, uh, with urges to perform repetitive, ritualistic behaviors called compulsions. The movie, as good as it gets, uh, highlights this very well. Jack Nicholson's character has uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and is very particular about how he walks around the, the restaurant and his apartment building and, his, and the street and, and who he talks to and what he wears and things like that. And again, in uh, the last lecture, I highly recommended watching the VH1 series, The OCD Project. Uh, that is a wonderful series, just eight episodes long. Uh, but really shows what it's like for people to live with some very intense forms of OCD and what treatment very realistically looks like for uh, for people who are struggling to uh, to overcome this disorder. Um, so again, it's it's essentially this this ritualistic behavior that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but it makes sense to the psychological rules that the person has come up with. As, as alleviating the stress of the unknown. So for example, one uh, uh, person, uh, not a character, is a real person from that, that show, The OCD Project, believed that her son was going to die. Uh, if I recall correctly, that she thought her son was going to die of cancer, and that through her own kind of anxiety and getting wound up with the thought of, of possibly losing her child, she had this kind of rule that kind of built up in her mind that if she turned off the light switch, turned it on and off an even number of times, perhaps 14 or 16 times before she left the, the house for the day, that that kept things symmetrical. It kept the world in line and in tune and in harmony and wouldn't distort the natural order of things and therefore would not lead to her child getting cancer. If she were to flip the light switch an odd number of times and leave the house, then she upset the natural order of the world and that that likely could lead to her child developing this terrible uh, disease. So um, 
this is a, a again one example of, of OCD and, and what it's like for somebody to struggle with this. Some people like to think that OCD is is uh, you know being very neat, excessive cleanliness, and things like that. And uh, the point with OCD, as well as any disorder that's been discussed and will be discussed today, is we have to look for it to be disruptive in the person's life. And we'll look at this a little bit more in depth later. But the important piece here is that it has to disrupt the person's life uh, so that they cannot live and, and perform in their expected roles, uh, such as a, an employee, a parent, a sibling, or whatnot. Uh, they can't perform at their fullest potential because of this disorder that has developed. So if you're very neat and clean, that's great, as long as it doesn't impede with your ability to be a loving mother or husband or a, uh, an excellent employee. But as, set, as soon as you start spending two hours every morning to uh, to clean the bathroom because it's it's too dirty and that starts getting you late to work or you have to get up early and it's disrupting your sleep and whatnot, as soon as it starts to intrude in other areas of your life, that's when it becomes a disorder. And that's when we start to consider it being obsessive compulsive disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is the, the final one that we'll look at for anxiety disorders. This is an anxiety disorder following extraordinary stress, as the name implies. Now again, th this is most commonly uh, connected with members of the military who experience traumatic events uh, overseas and then come home and, and have uh, some difficulty adjusting to civilian life. And, and certainly that is a, a very common occurrence um, in those cases. And what's important to note is that it is that the inability to uh, overcome the stressful m moment in the moment that leads to later stress. Essentially that when you see something so traumatic that your mind kind of puts it away and says, I can't deal with this right now, I'll have to deal with it later, but you don't appropriately spend the time thinking about it and talking about it with others and trying to process through that traumatic event. When you just hold it in and you kind of let it eat away at you, that's when you can start to experience the symptoms of PTSD. So for example, we see a firefighter here holding a, uh, a burned teddy bear. Uh, it could be that perhaps he uh, lost a child of his own in a, in a fire in years prior and, uh, and that was something that was very traumatic for him. Uh, something that, that that really shook him and bothered him and then he goes to another fire later on and finds that uh, a burned teddy bear that reminded him of his own child's bear perhaps when his child was younger um, he finds something that reminds him of that this reminder then brings up all these unresolved memories and stresses of his own child and it's going to cause him to uh, to not be able to do his job, he's going to lose focus, he's going to get kind of lost in his memories and just keep thinking and ruminating about these horrible uh, traumatic memories of his own and that's going to cause a significant deal of stress again to the point where he's not going to be able to perform his job as expected. That's when we would start to consider it to be a disorder and that we uh, we need to look into treatment options uh, for this person. Again just a hypothetical example for this disorder. So some possible explanations for anxiety disorders. We have psychological reasons, perhaps faulty cognitions, kind of inappropriate ways of thinking, uh, thinking of rules in, in a, that, that aren't necessarily true, or maladaptive learning, that pairing things together that don't necessarily go together. Uh, again, we think of the light switch and causing cancer. Um, if, if the light switch is associated with this kind of natural harmony and symmetry, which is actually very common in uh, people who have OCD, trying to find symmetry and harmony and balance, um, that when they, when they f are trying to find that harmony and balance, they begin to pair things that, again, don't make sense, like the light switch and cancer. So um, they begin to kind of uh, uh, have a different understanding of the world. And these are, uh, that's one psychological perspective for uh, for how it could have developed. Biologically could be evolution, genetics, brain functioning, biochemistry could be some major disruption in the uh, the brain chemistry of the individual um, in terms of what uh, what their their levels are of their various neurotransmitters and and how they get disrupted when they are presented with stressful situations. And lastly, socio-cultural pieces. There could be environmental stressors. There could be so, uh, cultural socialization. Essentially, that if they're around a group of people telling them we have to keep it to ourselves and never bring it up again, uh, that could lead to further disorders if they're not 
presented with opportunities to deal with it in a way that feels natural to them and feels healthy. And here's a graph that, uh, that, that further highlights this, uh, factors that can contribute to anxiety uh, with regard to uh, psychological, biological, and sociocultural issues. They all come together to uh, an interrelated, interrelated um, format to produce these anxiety disorders. We can't just say it's because of psychological issues, biological issues, or sociocultural issues. They all play some role in developing this, uh, this um, anxiety disorder and therefore are often uh, considered in conjunction uh, with regarding to diagnosis and treatment. Now let's take a look at some mood disorders. We'll take a look at uh, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, and kind of uh, some explanations regarding mood disorders in general. So in, in, with regard to mood disorders, they're essentially uh, um, emotional extremes, and they come in two basic forms. There's the major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. Major depressive disorder is kind of the common cold of, of psychological disorders. In a year, about 6% of men and, and about 9% of women will report depression worldwide. It's pretty high numbers when you, uh, when you consider things. Um, but there's so a distinct uh, difference that needs to be made between something that's kind of like a blue mood versus uh, a major depressive disorder. Somebody who feels just a little sad, a little down in the dumps, maybe for uh, a number of hours or even uh, a number of days, um, that is going to be different than someone who has major depressive disorder. It's similar to someone who's gasping for air after a hard run versus somebody who has chronic shortness of breath. We think of somebody who uh, goes through a, a uh, a long run, uh, a hard sprint, something like that, and uh, or a difficult workout regimen, we would expect them to be gasping for air, for them to have some difficulty with breathing just because of what they're going through. Uh, but somebody who experiences that, regardless of the situation, is going to ha likely have some sort of medical issue. This is similar to major depressive disorder, that if somebody uh, goes through a breakup, or they, they, they watch the news, then they have some sad news, and, and that's, that, of course, makes the person feel a little sad. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that person has major depressive disorder. They're reacting to things as we would expect them, uh, even if it lingers for a short while. When, when, somebody, when, when it lasts beyond the existence of the sad situation, and it presents itself even during uplifting and happy moments, and, it's, and it continues on and on and on, then we need to look at the possibility for it to be a psychological issue like major depressive disorder. The major depressive disorder occurs when signs of depression last for two weeks or more and are not caused by drugs or medical conditions. Some signs of major depressive disorder include lethargy and tiredness, feelings of worthlessness, losing interest in family and friends, and, and losing interest in activities. Essentially that if you love playing guitar and you love playing video games and uh, you like to read comic books and, and uh, go to movies and all that, suddenly you start going through that checklist and you're thinking, you know, none of those things seem to make me happy anymore. Or your friends are calling you up saying, hey, let's go out this weekend. You're thinking, no, I think I'd rather stay inside. You like to, you know, maybe just kind of you know, mess around on the computer or whatever. Um, and you start thinking, man, I just, I don't feel like I'm, I'm, you know, worth anything anymore. I can't really think of anything in my life that's uh, that where I can point to that's really a sign of hope or, or motivation or anything. And overall, you find yourself sleeping a lot, kind of being a bit lethargic and don't really having any energy. When you have these, the, these combination of symptoms and they all start to kind of check off one by one, you really get pretty close, if not uh, uh, very, with certainty, meeting criteria for major depressive disorder when it lasts for two weeks or more. When this is a problem that occurs over a great deal of time, then this is a serious concern and you absolutely need to seek professional help to, to get this uh, properly diagnosed and perhaps treated. Now dysthymic disorder is pretty unique. It's, it's a little bit different than major depressive disorder uh, because it kind of lies in the in-between uh, phase between blue mood and major depressive disorder. Uh, this disorder is characterized by daily depression lasting two years or more, but it's not as severe as major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder can kind of come and go uh, over a span of weeks or months 
and uh, and again disappear for weeks or months um, and uh, just kind of gradually settle into some depression and then gradually kind of uh, crawl your way out and, and climb out of the pit and you're okay for a while then back down uh, again we're talking over several weeks to, to months um, and perhaps even again being in remission for even longer but dysthymic disorder is just kind of just always having a foot in the pit or always having like half your body in the pit always down a little bit not way way down in the dumps and just destroyed it's just being really pretty sad for two years or more it's just kind of part of your your being that you don't always feel like you could be as happy as, as you once were um, that would be considered dysthymic disorder now bipolar disorder was once called manic depressive disorder and this this highlights the alteration between depression and mania uh, because this is what signals bipolar disorder so we have uh, depressive symptoms such as uh, feeling uh, gloomy uh, being withdrawn having the inability to make decisions feeling tired slowness of thought you kind of think of what we have talked about so far with major depressive disorder uh, this is essentially a very similar presentation we have the depressive side on the other side we have the manic symptoms feeling elated, feeling euphoric, having a strong desire for action, feeling hyperactive, and, and having a flight of ideas or multiple ideas that kind of come in all at once and, it's, and your mind is racing and you feel excited by all this creativity kind of surging in all at once. Uh, it, feeling manic often feels very good. Again, we take a look at uh, elation and euphoria. Those are, are wonderful experiences to have. And the person going through uh, mania often feels very driven and they're excited to try new things and take risks and, and live life. Uh, it's very different from the depressive side. And these, th this highlights bipolar disorder exactly. It shows the, the, the kind of pit that can, a person can go through for a period of weeks uh, or months and then kind of coming out uh, of the pit and, and kind of walking on, on flat ground for a while and then all of a sudden they feel like they can fly they jump right up they, they grow their wings and and they just think they can do anything and uh, and feel a newfound energy eventually those wings are going to burn up and they're going to come back down and crash into the ground and uh, uh, eventually kind of make their way into the pit again now i want to highlight some uh, the differences between major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder with this graph so take a look here with major depressive disorder, we have uh, kind of our, our uh, normal mood level, we have clinical depression, um, and this elated kind of uh, manic phase. In the top graph, we see uh, major depressive disorder and how there could be this, this dip way into clinical depression, severe depression, and then back up to kind of the normal mood level, just feel a little down in the dumps, and maybe you kind of crawl out of it and things are okay. With major, or I'm sorry, with the bipolar disorder, it'll go as high as elation in the manic and then right back down into clinical depression uh, and something I want to highlight right here is that this again occurs over a span of weeks rapid cycling bipolar disorder which is uh, generally rare in in uh, the realm of bipolar disorder occurs it means that we see this this fluctuation occur over weeks roughly like two weeks in bipolar in the uh, the manic stage two weeks in the depression stage um, and again that's that's pretty rare that's that's called rapid cycling uh, the more common forms of bipolar disorder will see things stretch into months or even just a couple of weeks of mania several several weeks to months of, of kind of normal mood maybe a couple of weeks of depression several months of normal mood uh, but they're significant enough, again, to be disruptive in the person's life. If we can still point to these clear moments of significant spans of time, it seems like in February that Tom was feeling very manic and uh, was on top of the world and, and was very energized and charged. Uh, but then things were okay. But man, once June came, uh, Tom was so sad and he was just all down in the dumps. And he thought he was going to uh, get fired from his job. And he didn't want to go anywhere. And then he was kind of, kind of got okay, and the rest of the summer he was fine. That's more typical bipolar disorder. Uh, so when people say, "Oh, that person's bipolar because they're very moody, they're up and down in the span of a of a of one day," that's not criteria. That's not really bipolar disorder. That's someone just being very moody. And um, uh, of course, there could be anything else going on there, but uh, that's not enough information to, to say the person has bipolar because. This, again, is going to be a change we see over uh, a great span of time. 
Now, we, we want to look at uh, why mood disorders, like how, how do we explain mood disorders and, uh, and, and make sense of them. So we want to take a look at behavioral and cognitive changes. We want to look at some common causes of depression. Uh, because depression is so prevalent worldwide, investigators want to develop a theory of depression and, and suggest ways to treat it. And again, we do this by looking at, at these common factors. Um, that basically, we want to look at gender differences as well. We want to be able to explain why it is that females experience depression so much more frequently around the world rather than males. We also want to uh, consider why depressive episodes self-terminate, why it seems like somebody just kind of not, not even grows out of it. That, that doesn't happen. They just come out of it just on, on, regardless of what's going on. Um, they could be playing a video game and beat a certain level, and all of a sudden, oh, they feel pretty good, and that's all right. Whereas every other attempt to try to get the person spiked with, with excitement and happiness didn't work. Now, uh, again, depression can be um, uh, can continue to linger regardless of what's going on in the person's life, or it could seemingly just kind of uh, erase or go into uh, remission for the, the smallest thing. Depression is also increasing, especially in teens, and we need to we need to be able to explain that and figure out why uh, uh, depression exists and what it means for people and our and our health. Suicide is the the most severe form of behavioral response to depression. It e each year about one million people commit suicide worldwide, and the rate of completion for suicide is much higher in males than females. Primarily, it's theorized because males typically use much more violent means to attempt suicide and are therefore uh, more likely to complete it. Simply put, a male is more likely to use a gun or a knife in his suicide attempt than a female. A female is more likely to use, uh, use pills or strangulation or something else that is more difficult or requires much more time for death to, to occur. Therefore, uh, females generally have more attempts and have a greater likelihood of attempting, but because they generally use non-violent uh, or less violent forms of, uh, of attempting suicide, they're not nearly as, uh, as frequently completing suicide as males. And as people get older, in both cases, uh, the, the uh, rate of suicide increases. Uh, it's it's uh, theorized this could be because of watching friends and family members around them passing away due to natural causes or diseases, watching uh, your loved ones wither away and, and struggle with um, uh, end-of-life issues and, and um, uh, not having as many people come to visit and, and be involved in your life, not being productive in your uh, in your career anymore, not having uh, uh, children to to, uh, to 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 birth to uh, to grow and to um, and, and to watch grow. Um, when you consider the uh, uh, the life experience of somebody age 65 and older, it's very different in terms of reinforcing life experiences of love and uh, uh, accomplishment and whatnot than somebody in uh, in their earlier years and therefore um, people will much uh, suicide attempts become much more common on the biological perspective there are genetic influences it's been discovered that uh, mood disorders run in families that uh, rates of depression are higher in identical twins than fraternal twins when twins share uh, uh, share their dna like that then we begin to see a very strong link with uh, with regard to genetics and, and uh, presence of depression. Um, and linkage analysis and, and association studies continue to link possible genes and dispositions for depression. PET scans also show that brain energy consumption rises and falls with manic and depressive episodes. Now here's somebody who would uh, likely be diagnosed as rapid cycling bipolar disorder. We see on May 17th the depressed state their brain is hardly lit up, it's mostly blue, uh, shades of blue, and uh, in the manic state that they, they enter the next day, they, uh, uh, it's very, very sharply lit up again. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, 
there's a lot going on, blood rushing everywhere. Um, and then about nine days later, when they come out of mania and get back into their depressed state, um, it's back to looking similar to uh, May 17th, just 10 days prior when they were in the depressed state. Um, so again, the depressed brain and the manic brain look very, very different from uh, from a normal brain. We would see kind of an average between the two, uh, more uh, kind of green, a little bit of yellow in a, a normal brain. The social cognitive perspective suggests that depression arises partly because of self-defeating beliefs and negative explanatory styles. That when you have uh, a negative explanatory style and you're, and you're just thinking that the world is bad for X, Y, or Z reason, if you can kind of think of a reason and apply it and, and it makes some sort of logical sense to you, you're going to develop what's called learned helplessness. That if you could find a negative explanation for anything around you, you're going to agree with it, you're going to believe it, and you're going to think, well, what's the point? Why bother doing anything about it if this is the way the world is and I can't do it? If I'm just one person and I've learned that the world is, is going to screw me over and, and it's a sad place to live in, then why even bother? And it's just going to feed that kind of depressed mood. Um, it, and again, if the person experiences traumatic or negative events, we're looking at the bottom now, uh, that they have these traumatic experiences um, and there are these cultural expectations that, that the world is sad or you got to keep your feelings to yourself um, or there are kind of depression evoked responses that's going to increase depressed mood. Go back to the biological influences and having a genetic predisposition, predisposition, sorry, predisposition and you have uh, a family history of it or perhaps even brain damage uh, due to stress and other factors and all linking to this depressed mood, then they, they're all coming together and, and forming this uh, depressive disorder. The depression cycle, essentially that we have uh, the negative stressful events, the stressful experiences a person would, would naturally have, uh, then we would have kind of a pessimistic explanatory style that this is just the way the world is and it's a dark place, a screwed up place, and, and so who cares, I shouldn't do anything about it. Uh, then we have this hopeless depressed state of that's of that's it. Why should I feel any happiness because uh, this is a, a dark, uh, depressing world? And that hampers the way that the individual thinks and acts and thus fuels that personal rejection that they're going to keep other people away from them because they only think they're going to be harmed by that other person. Or they're looking for the way that other people are going to screw them over because that's the way that people are. When you're looking for these things, you're likely going to find them because, not necessarily because that's the way people are, but, but more likely because the way that you are portraying yourself and the way that you are treating others around you uh, with possibly like a sour face or saying, I'm too busy to, uh, to spend time with you tonight, or uh, you really don't want to uh, get me anything for Christmas and, you know, don't even bother because, uh, you know, it's just a waste of money anyway. You know, perhaps to a parent or a sibling or somebody who would more than be happy to uh, to get you a present. Um, so again, it all just kind of keeps going over and over and over again. Christmas comes, you don't get the present, and that confirms that uh, it's a stressful experience that confirms that thought you had, that people just suck and yada, yada, yada. You keep, the person kind of keeps setting themselves up for this uh, depressing experience. So when, uh, another example here, break up with a romantic partner. Uh, so somebody who has a, a, uh, a stable or kind of a static way of thinking and they apply the, the sad thoughts to a global uh, realm of existence and, and internalize everything, they're going to experience depression. They're going to think, I'll never get over this. Again, a very stable, kind of static uh, way of thinking that this is never going to get better. Without my partner, I can't seem to do anything right. Again, globalizing it, blowing it up and saying that this exists everywhere and then internalizing it, that our breakup was all my fault. That is, that is the one, two, three punch that all leads straight to depression uh, because it's difficult to argue against any of those because you can certainly think, well, I had some fault in it, but when you think it's all your fault, that's a lot of weight to carry. Uh, without my partner, I can't seem to do anything right. Certainly call into question some issues with regard to maybe relationship uh, abilities of, of uh, how well you can maintain a healthy relationship. Um, the person who, who can focus on that specific issue and not blow it up to uh, a global uh, realm is certainly going to do better. So let's take a look on the other side again. Somebody who thinks uh, in a temporary sense that uh, this is hard to take, but I will get through this. 
that it's not like I'll never get over it, but that this is just tough for right now. And somebody who's very specific and says, I miss my partner, but thankfully I have my my family and other friends, that there are other people to love in this moment. And because this experience of sadness and this rejection of love is only coming from one specific person. And the external uh, uh, location of where this is coming from, that it takes two to make a relationship work and it wasn't meant to be, that you're essentially sharing the load and the burden of the failed relationship with the other person because it absolutely does take two people to have a healthy relationship. And it's not necessarily saying that the other person screwed up or anything, but at the very least, they screwed up about as much as you did. Um, and so when you begin to kind of think in these ways, that's successful coping, and the and a person will likely avoid uh, falling into that pit of, of major depressive disorder. So again, we're taking a look at the explanatory style and how that plays a major role in becoming depressed. Well, that's all we got, though, for anxiety and depressive disorders. Uh, next time, we'll talk a bit about schizophrenia, and uh, then we'll look into some treatment modalities after that. So if you have any questions, go ahead and post it in the, uh, the thread. I'll take a look at them. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next time.